Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, with Kerbal Space Program moving to Unity 5, lots of noise has been made in the community about the coming of 64-bit and the promise this holds. Similarly, over the last year, Cloud Imperium has been talking about their work moving CryEngine over to 64-bit to fix a number of issues with Star Citizen. There's been much discussion, and much in the way of misinformation from fans of both projects, and the mistakes I keep seeing are because these projects are going from 32 to 64 bits in completely different ways. In fact, I'll bet right now that there's somebody out there writing a comment about to correct my statement that one of these games wasn't already using 64 bits. Just stop that right now because you'll end up regretting it if you don't watch the whole video first. So, I'd like to take this opportunity to bring out my computer science hat and talk about 32 versus 64 bit and what those really mean when we're talking about internet spaceships. I don't actually know what a computer science hat looks like, but I, I have to imagine that it has some flashing lights or something on it. But anyway, when we're talking about 32 versus 64, what we're really talking about is the amount of memory that numbers are being stored in. 8 bits makes 1 byte, so a 32-bit number takes 4 bytes, and 64 bits takes 8 bytes. And any computer you're working on will have billions and billions of bytes of memory, so space isn't a constraint that forces developers to pick between 32 or 64-bit numbers. We're really not talking about the computer architecture or the underlying operating system. It's completely legit to store a 32-bit number on a 64-bit system, or a 64-bit number on a 32-bit system. System. And indeed, it's quite common to store even 16 or 8-bit values when necessary. I started coding in an era when 8-bit data was the rule. A bit lets you store either a 0 or a 1, that's two different states. And 2 bits lets you store 4 states because that's 2 times 2, and 3 bits gives you 8 because that's 2 times 2 times 2, and 8 bits, well, that's 256 states. Now what those states mean depend upon how the code is using the values. A simple example is that we can store a number by mapping each state to a single whole number. So 8 bits might let you, a programmer, store a number from 0 to 255. More bits means bigger numbers. 16 bits means about 65,000 states. 32 bits stores about 4 billion and 64 bits stores 16 billion billion, roughly. Now if your program tries to store a number without giving it enough bits, bad things can happen. For example, in Pac-Man, the highest level you can reach is level 255, and if you get to 256, then the game runs out of bits to store the level number and things break so badly that level 256 is known as the kill screen. But all sorts of data can be stored in a computer memory. All the models, the textures, the sounds that make up a game are also stored as big chunks of complex data. And when they're loaded into memory, a programmer needs to keep track of where they are in the gigabytes of memory. And this is done by remembering their address. An address is just a number which corresponds to a location in memory. If you have a large resource like a texture, then what you do is you store the pointer to its location so that you can use the texture without having to copy it all around the memory. Because the older version of Unity is 32-bit, it uses 32-bit pointers, which can cover about 4 billion memory locations, or 4 gigabytes. So in general, a process that is using 32-bit addressing will run out of space after using about 4 gigs of memory. Even if your computer has much more memory, the program itself, which is using the old 32-bit addressing, would be unable to use more than four, and that's what's been happening with Kerbal Space Program. If you loaded too many mods, then you'd run out of places that are addressable to store the data for all those mods. So with the move to 64-bit addressing in Kerbal Space Program 1.1, now this memory limit is no longer there and you can throw as many mods in there as you like without running out of memory. You might crash for many other reasons, but it won't be because you're running out of memory. Now for Star Citizen, this wasn't the case. Even the earliest hangar-only builds used 64-bit pointers, and the minimum spec for the game it required 8 gigabytes of memory to support all those detailed ship assets. The 64-bit translation that happened with Star Citizen is nothing to do with memory. It's instead all about mathematics and physics. 
Remember that those values are just like numbers that can be used for anything? Well, in the old days of single screen games like Space Invaders or Pac-Man, it would be normal to store the player's position as a pair of 8-bit values for the X and the Y coordinates on the screen. But as games started to get bigger and more complicated, developers needed to store more information and do more mathematics on that data, and they began to find that important numbers like pi just don't have a natural integer representation. It turns out that if you want to do 3D graphics, then you'll find a constant need for non-integer numbers. Computers have a standardized way of dealing with these values, with numbers on both sides of the decimal point the floating point number. They're called floating point values because the decimal point can float around to accommodate very small values or very big values. How this works is that the number is approximated into a fractional part and an exponent. Now this probably sounds really complicated, but I'll bet that you've done this yourself all the time. For example, if you were faced with the number 9,410,537.27, you might just say 9.41 million and quietly forget about the fact that you're wrong by about 0.06%. In this case, 9.41 is the fractional part and million or 10 to the power six is the exponent. And it works in the other direction. A quarter of an inch is about 0 0.00635 meters, but you're more likely to say 6.35 milliliters or in exponent form, that's 6.35 times 10 to the minus three meters. So floating point numbers let you step away from the limitations of the natural integer numbers that computers use. They're a great abstraction that let developers think about what they want to do instead of how they have to do it. They also provide special numbers for things like infinity and not a number, which can be very useful for dealing with edge cases. But they do come at a cost. The approximation of the fractional part has only a limited number of accurate digits. And in the case of a 32-bit single precision floating point number, you'll get about six figures of accuracy. This matters a great deal in games with physics engines that use floating point numbers. Now imagine we represent the player's position using a floating point number for distance in meters from the center of the universe, or as programmers like to say, the origin. When the player is within 10 meters of the origin, the position is accurate to micrometers. But when the player runs out for a couple of minutes and ends up about a kilometer away from the origin, out here, the position is only accurate to about a millimeter. And then say they drive in a car and go about 10 kilometers out, now the accuracy is only down to one centimeter. If you were, say, simulating a realistic cockpit, you might notice that the player's uh, fingers that were flipping switches in the cockpit didn't quite line up exactly. Now, out at 100 kilometers and the accuracy is down to 10 centimeters, imagine a model of the player and the gun that they're holding both represented with their own coordinates. The gun could easily be a couple of inches out of place, perhaps clipping through the player's hand or mysteriously floating in thin air and going down to planetary scale and the position error is over a meter. This is one of the reasons why Kerbal Space Program's planets are one-tenth the size of real planets. The game engine forces the use of single precision coordinates for the terrain. Scaling the planet up to realistic sizes using realism overhaul amplifies these terrain glitches. Based on these scales, you can see how a regular first-person shooter would be unlikely to notice these precision problems due to the natural size of the levels. But for a spaceship game, and moreover a spaceship game with simulated crew physics, the large scales and human-level accuracy requirements become evident even in normal gameplay. So, the Star Citizen developers were able to dig deep into their game engine and replace all those 32-bit floating point numbers with 64-bit versions. Programmers call the 64-bit versions double precision numbers, and they provide at least 15 digits of precision. That's enough to track locations anywhere within the solar system to within millimeter accuracy. At least that's what I presume they've done, because with low-level access to the game engine, it's the most logical thing to do. But coming back to Kerbal Space Program, they didn't have low-level access to their game engine, and they had to slay the Kraken while working around these limitations forced upon them. One of the ways Squad got around the distance from the origin issues is by using a floating origin for the physics engine. When the player's vessel loads, the center of the universe is set close to them, and when they move too far away, the game freezes, 
the state of everything and quietly moves the universe around the player, putting them back at the centre. So each coordinate in the game is actually a pair of values. It's also worth pointing out that Kerbal Space Program also has a second way of tracking vessels. Orbits on rails. Whenever an object is out of physics range or time acceleration is being used, everything moves along an orbit. And this is all outside the realm of Unity's physics engine, implemented by the developers of Kerbal Space Program. And you can be darn sure that all that math is being done in double precision. Because anybody that works with the math of science and physics uses double precision. It's what you do. There's one other somewhat famous example of numerical precision in video games that some early Kerbal Space Program players may be familiar with. In Minecraft, the terrain generation uses floating point numbers and once you get far enough away from the centre of the world, the terrain breaks down. In certain versions of the game, the world would turn into a crazy mass of random terrain noise, kind of like a wall when you got far enough away from the start point. And this region is called the Farlands, and they kick in about 12,000 kilometers from the origin. Traveling this distance in the game world is a major undertaking, but there's a YouTuber called Kurt J. Mack who's spent years documenting his journey to the Farlands. Kurt is listed in the Kerbal Space Program credits for his promotion of the game in the early days. Now, the misuse of floating point numbers isn't confined to video games. Uh, as a programmer, I occasionally encounter them being used incorrectly. Back uh, during the 1991 Gulf War, the Patriot missile system was deployed to protect targets against Scud missiles, and the timing system translated the clock into a floating point numbers in such a way that over time, the round-off error would actually build up, and after about 100 hours, the clock on the targeting system would be off by about a third of a second, in which time an incoming missile would have travelled half a kilometre. This error was enough to make the system miss targets, and in some cases mistake incoming missiles as radio noise and ignore the threat. I'm sure a ton of you already have the experience in computer science to know these stories, but they're fine examples of the kinds of limitations that developers encounter and how they work around them. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.